Hi. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's a great Sunday, the second Sunday in no- our November series, Turning the World Upside Down. We're, uh, we're having a, what we call a new vision November uh, throughout this month to think about the future that God has in store and think about following boldly into that future. And uh, to kind of ground this month, we've been thinking about the relationship between Paul and the Thessalonians. Uh, He started the church in Thessalonica. We read that story last week in Acts chapter 17. And he wrote two very poignant letters to the people. And this is from his first letter to the Thessalonians in the second chapter, the first eight verses. Paul writes to them, You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and had been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. When they went to Thessalonica, they were met with great opposition there. In fact, so great was their opposition that they were accused of turning the world upside down. He continues, for our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or from trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians describing why he did what he did, describing his, his motivation, We're talking about the why, the motivation. A lot of people have little motivational uh, sayings, little posters, coffee mugs maybe. How many of you have at least one motivational thing somewhere in your house that you read and you think, I'm going to get going. Yeah, we share them online. We share pictures online with these little motivational things. One of my favorites is from the wise philosopher Dwight Schrute, who, um, whose motivation uh, goes like this. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. Oh, man, mm, gets you. Doesn't it get you? <laughs> Why do we do what we do? And that's a pretty good motivation, actually, to not do what idiots do. I think that should be right up at the top of the list. We're talking about our why. So when I'm on stage, when, when actors are on stage, they need a reason. They need a motivation to get from point A to point B. They can't just walk there. They have to have a reason that they're walking there. I need my motivation. There was a, a story about Alfred Hitchcock directing one of his movies. I don't know which one it was. But an actor said to him, Mr. Hitchcock... I'm, I'm having trouble on this scene. What is my motivation in this scene? And Mr. Hitchcock allegedly said, Sir, your motivation is your paycheck. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's pretty good motivation. For, motivation can be different. Even for doing the same thing, the same act can be motivated by different impulses, by different whys. So let's take, for example, studying in school, something we all should have done and most of us did, um, we study in school. Why, so give me a motivation for studying in school. To get a good grade, to a good grade all right? We've got to get that, that good grade so we're motivated to study. What's another motivation for studying in school? Say it loudly. Learn. To learn, oh, to learn something. How about that? That's kind of actually learn something by studying. You might be motivated to not flunk, <laughs> which is different than getting a good grade. Avoiding the F is a powerful motivation. Like, just show me the minimum, man. Let me just (laughs) get by, right? You might be motivated to study because you don't want to make your teacher angry or you want to, you know, 
earn that status with your teacher, of teacher's pet. Oh, um, my teacher will be so happy if I study and do well on this. Um, but, and then you do the same thing. So you could do the same thing with all these different motivations. And the motivations are very, very different. I mean, it's a very different motivation to study for a test to learn something as opposed to studying for a test so you won't flunk the class. It's just, it's just different. I'm not going to assign value which one's better or worse. They're just different motivations. So we're going to spend some time today talking about, thinking about our motivations for doing what we do. Paul was describing his motivations in this passage from Thessal- Thessalonians uh, today. He, didn't, he said he didn't do what he did to get people to like him, to earn praise from people, He wasn't trying to turn the world upside down to make other people happy. He wasn't trying to bring himself any kind of glory or praise. He was doing it because God wanted him to. He was doing it to glorify God. He was doing it to share God's love with these people because he cared so deeply for them. That was his motivation, even though it was a struggle, even though it was hard to do. His motivation for turning this world upside down was God's will, God's call and his love, Paul's love for the people. So we're going to talk a little bit about why we do what we do. My part of the sermon is now over. Now it's up to you guys to fill in the blanks. The first question that I want to ask you, it's a very simple one. Why are you here today? Yesterday morning we had some more great conversations in our worship services and that was a great question to get things started. People were thinking about why they particularly had come this morning to be a part of the church. We're talking about why and what motivates us and it was a great conversation with a lot of different thoughts and ideas but I was able to pick out a couple of themes that kind of ran throughout all three of our worship services. First of all, people talked about how the church does what it does in order to create a sense of community and belonging. Several people mentioned how the church was a home for them. And one person talked about how the church is one neighborhood in their village, which I thought was a really cool image. That community holds us accountable because when you're doing church stuff and you see people who are doing church stuff along with you, you feel like, hey, I'm doing the right thing here. And also, in addition to the accountability part, Um, People talked about how the church's purpose is to help us be vulnerable with each other so that we can indeed grow in our faith. And that was the second theme that I heard throughout the morning, that one of the things the church does most significantly is to help people grow, get closer to God, is what a lot of people said. And that's the reason we have small groups and Bible studies and, and those types of topical conversations, so that we can get closer to God deepen our understanding of who God is. People talked about how they learn more and more about God and about who God wants us to be, and that's one of the purposes for for church, and especially for why the church has smaller groups that meet outside of the worship experience. A third purpose was um, kind of a reminder to us. So church does what it does to remind us that it's not about us, that it's about God, and it's about others first. Somebody said when we were talking about why does the church give an offering, uh, to remind us that that money isn't ours in the first place. There's a lot of talk about, about helping others and about how offering Christ to the world is a way to help us remember that we're not the center of everything. It's not all about us. In our service and in our giving, it extends us outward into God's world. And that is the purpose for what we do. It was a wonderful conversation with a lot of different thoughts and ideas. And I was struck by how many people were very interested in why we only do communion every so often. It seems at every service somebody asked, why don't we do that every single week? Obviously something we need to think about. Also, we talked about the need and the purpose for inviting others to be a part of the congregation. A lot of people are really concerned with the health and the vitality of the body of Christ in its ability to perform its mission in the world, and the need to reach out and invite others to be a part of that mission for the sake of continuing that mission into the future seemed to be on a lot of people's minds yesterday. It was a great conversation. We have a couple more conversations for New Vision November coming up. I hope you'll uh, come to worship and participate in those conversations. I hope you'll come uh, to Monday night prayer meeting. I hope you'll come 
to your small group ready to talk about stuff, and I hope you'll be doing your individual devotions each day as we together as a congregation envision the future that God has in store for us.